we're going to carry on from uh, uh, 19th chapter of Revelation. We finished 18th chapter. We got uh, actually four more chapters only. So we'll probably finish much earlier than we expected. I expected to finish by end of uh, by middle of December, but probably we'll finish this month. Doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, uh, from here, it's very very self-explanatory. But here and there, I'll give explanations where where it's required to be explained. But we come to a very interesting part now about the salvation, uh, time of uh, judgment, and then how uh, God's people rejoice over the fact that uh, God has taken, uh, is uh, paying back to those who trouble God's people as he promised in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, 6 to 9. I'm going to request uh, Andrew to read this particular uh, passage before you go on. Keep that as a background. Uh, basically, God's people are crying out for justice because they are persecuted all along, all the two two thousand years. And the time has come for God to uh, pay back to those who troubled them, and that is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. So, Andrew, could you read Second Thessalonians chapter one six to nine? Andrew's not in the meeting, I think. Oh, he's there. His audio is not connected. You have to unmute him, no? No, no, his audio is not connected. Yeah, okay, he's joined now. Yeah. Do you want me Andrew? to do? Yeah, could you repeat the press, uh, passage, brother? He's there now. Uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, 6 to 9. Okay, Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Six to nine, correct. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. Okay. With this in mind, until 12, no? I'm on nine, verse, 12, verse 9 only I wanted. Okay, sorry, yeah. Okay. Now, with this background, uh, before you go to 19th chapter, uh, let's keep this in the background, how God uh, has uh, promised justice to his people, and uh, he will give relief to those who are troubled and punish those who trouble them. And that is going to happen on the day of judgment. Now, look at 19th chapter of Revelation. Read from verse 1, verse 1 and 2 in the beginning. After this, I heard was sound like a roar of a great multitude in heaven, shouting, Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Now, the word salvation here uh, is a word called soteria. There are two words for salvation in the Bible, New Testament, sozo and soteria. Soteria specifically refers to deliverance from evil and from the evil one. Deliverance from sin and the evil one, soteria. And the savior means soter. Soter means savior, that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Soteria is specifically deliverance from evil and sin. There's one more word for uh, salvation in the New Testament, a word called sozo. Sozo is basically preservation, sustenance. For example, women be saved through childbirth, it says. And that saving is preserved, uh, protected. They won't die in childbirth, they'll be protected. So the two different words. Here refers to specifically the salvation from sin and from the evil one. That's the salvation we all talk about when you talk about call upon the name of Jesus and you will be saved. That is from evil and evil one. Let's go on. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who cut the birth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of the servants. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again, I'd like to, uh, 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 Nick, I mean, not uh, Nickel read later on. I would like Andrew to read uh, Romans chapter 12, 17 to 21. 
Romans okay. 17 to 21. Yes. Um, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay. Till the judgment day, we Christians are not supposed to judge uh, those outside the church. We are supposed to judge those inside the church. We'll come to that a little later. So while we wait for the second coming of Christ, when people trouble us, we bless them. When they curse us, we bless them. When they persecute us, we endure. When they slander us, we answer kindly. And we are to repay evil with good. And God, even say, in fact, says in that passage, don't take revenge. To avenge is mine, I will repay. And now we find 19th chapter of Revelation, time has come for God to repay. And uh, it says here, he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And basically it means to the, uh, the prostitute or the woman, uh, um, Babylon, the mystery, the mystery of Babylon, which basically represents all the evil, uh, gate of the, of the uh, gods, uh, evil world. And Satan and his angels who trouble the world, persecute the world, persecute Christians basically, not the world. And the time has come for judgment and that's why the rejoicing in heaven Salvation belongs to God and, and they praise the Lord because the time has come for God to judge uh, evil, evil people, spirits that use evil people to persecute Christians. So till the judgment day, as believers in Christ, we are not supposed to judge those outside the church. In fact, we are supposed to judge those inside the church. 1 Corinthians 5, 12 and 13, Paul writes, what business of mine? business of mind to judge those outside the church or not to judge those inside the church. God judge those outside. We are supposed to judge Christians. The judging is not condemnation but correction. Correction in love to build up the other person. And therefore it's important for us to understand that believers, we believers must correct each other and judge each other after removing the plank in our eyes. In 7th chapter of Matthew, verse 1 and 2, read about how, do not judge or you'll be judged. The same measure, measure of judge, you'll be judged. But look at the next third, fourth and fifth verse. How can you judge your brother when you have a plank in your eye, when you have a speck of sawdust? Remove the plank, you can see, better remove the speck. So we're supposed to judge after removing the plank. Now the plank and the speck are same material. Plank is made of wood, speck of sawdust is made of wood. So if, suppose your brother has a problem, a sin, which is uh, to a certain degree, you have the same sin to a higher degree, then don't judge. Repent, turn from it, you can see better, remove the speck. So we are supposed to judge each other in the body of Christ after removing the plank. But please don't judge people of other faiths. They don't know the Lord. And therefore, it's important that till the judgment day, we should not take revenge on people who trouble us. Leave it to God. And here we find the fulfillment of what the Apostle Paul wrote to Thessalonians. God will judge. He is just God. All his ways are just. Verse 3. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke, smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Um, we could read, please. My mouth is little parched. Uh, can you read from verse? I really meant to stop whenever I wanted to stop. Uh, Nick, uh, from verse 4, can you read? Sure. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, and they cried, Amen, hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both small and great. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting. 
Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Okay, let me stop there. Now, when it talks about servants, verse 3, uh, verse 5. Praise our God, all you his servants. And who cries out? The 24 elders and the four living creatures. They are a constant in the vision that God gave to John. From uh, chapter 1 onwards, you find, uh, or maybe I think, yeah, from about chapter 1 on, with constantly, as John is seeing this vision, writing down the vision, you find the 24 elders and the four living creatures around uh, John in the vision. Now, how long the vision took for him to see, I don't know. Bible doesn't say that. Could have been one day, a couple of hours. Enough for him to write down the vision. And they say, they cry out, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice from heaven said, Praise our God, all his, all you his servants. Again, this word servants is a plural of the word servant. Servant is actually bonded servant or slave. D-O-U-L-O-S, dolos. Dolos means slave, bonded servant. And the plural for dolos is doloi. D-O-U-L-O-I. The word used here is doloi. And basically it means slaves. We are called to be a people who, like slaves, serve the Lord. As compared to servant, a slave is not entitled to wages. A servant works, slave labors. Servant gets wages, and a slave cannot demand wages. But different thing that God is so gracious, not only we are his slaves, we are his friends. As friends, we listen to him, listen to his voice, take care of his concerns for the world, and go about fulfilling our call like slaves. So as we serve him, as we labor for him, one more thing is, servants work, uh, slaves labor. We are supposed to labor for the Lord and labor in love. Out of love for the Lord we labor. So when we labor for the Lord, the time has come here when we praise him for the fact that ultimately we're going to get the reward in heaven. The Lord told his, uh, uh, all those who serve him in John 12, 26, Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant also will be. My father will, uh, will honor the one who serves me. Yes, we seek, we, we get honor from God. But don't seek, uh, you know, recognition for the work we do in this world from people. We seek honor from God. But we go about fulfilling his will like slaves. Yes, Nick, I read from verse uh, uh, 9. Okay, I, I didn't explain that. Um, here talks about... The Lamb of God and the great wedding of the bridegroom and the bride. Christ is the bridegroom, we are the bride. And this is the time has come for us to finally be reunited with God, with the Lamb of God. And the wedding of the Lamb has come. And fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And basically, this refers to the righteous acts of the saints. Basically, it means after receiving salvation, subsequently, we are called to do good works. We are not saved by works. We are saved by faith. Having been saved by faith, thereafter, all of us are called to do good works. Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, 10. It's by faith you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It's a gift of God. Not by works that no one can boast. We are saved by faith, not by works. Having said that, verse 10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Jesus Christ, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So all the righteous acts basically means the things that we do by the strength and wisdom God gives us for his glory and for education of his people. So doing good works is important, but it's only a response or outflow of our faith in Christ. So here it talks about all our acts will be remembered. And uh, that's the fine linen that the saints of God wear. Yes, from verse 9, Nick, could you read? Nick, from verse 9, Revelation 19, chapter verse 9. Then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who... Yeah, uh, Revelation 19. Then the angel said to me... Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes, 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's blocked. Uh, yeah, uh, audio is muted. Yes. Uh, Any problem with the network? Sorry. Normally, it's never happened before, but it could be. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Don't worry. Just go ahead. From verse nine. Then the angel said to me, Write, then the wife of the land, and he had to of God. I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers. So I think we read from verse 9, something missed out. We have problems, and I'll ask someone else to read them. Okay. Uh, brother Joseph uh, Thomas would like to read. Okay, okay. Let Brother Joseph Thomas read, yeah. Yeah, uh, Nick, your voice was breaking, Nick. Then the yeah, angel yeah. said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold on to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Yeah, so the angel says uh, to John, write, and blessed are those who are invited the wedding supper of the Lamb. And then because of the awesome visitation of God, the angel, John fell at the feet of this angel to worship him. Imagine even John, after so many years of being with Jesus, because so much overwhelmed by this amazing visitation, that it was so awesome that he just fell down and worshipped. And they said to him, the angel said, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you, with the brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. I'm alone we have to worship. A big lesson for all of us, that no entity except God should be worshipped. And uh, even the angels, when they appear in, the, in history, in, in, in the church history and in the people of God's history, Whenever the angels of God appeared, the people who saw the angel first initially afraid, and it happened to Daniel, it happened to so many people in the Bible, and always the angel said, fear not, peace unto you, peace unto you. So overwhelming is the visitation that the normal tendency, human tendency, is to bow down and worship. And the angel said, do not bow down, do not worship me, only God has to be worshipped. In fact, the worship, the word worship basically means to bow down. Literally, it means to bow down. Only God has to be worshipped. And he says, I am a fellow servant like you. A servant does the will of the master. And angels, actually, there are different kinds of angels, I guess. There's seraphim, cherubim, angelos, angeloi. Angeloi is plural for angelos, which means messenger of God. And uh, angels, actually, according to Hebrews 1.14, uh, the writer writes, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? So actually angels are messengers to serve us. We inherit salvation. By serving us, they are serving God. And if we as God's slaves, as God's servants are slaves, we serve people out of love for God in the same way. A leader in the, in the, in the Bible, a leader in the church, a leader in the church, the servant of the people he ministers to. Unlike in the worldly context, in the world, those who are in authority, not at all those entrusted them. As Christian leaders, we are supposed to be servants of people we minister to. The Lord told the 12 disciples that. 20th chapter of Matthew, verse 20 to 27, 20, 20 to 27, he gave a lecture, he gave a small discourse to the 12 disciples in the context of John and James saying, don't write in the left hand of Jesus. He called all 12 together. The other 10 heard about it, they were indignant. Why only John didn't want to be right in the left hand of Jesus? He called all them together and he tells them, rulers of Gentiles lord it over them. And the leaders accept authority to them. Not so with you. Who wants to be great among you must be a servant. Who wants to be first among you must be a slave. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And offer himself the ransom for many. 20th chapter, 20 chapter of uh, Matthew, verse 20 to 28. So 
angels serve us because they serve God and we serve people whom God has entrusted to us. So we're all servants. Along with them, fulfilling the will of the Father. Now the Apostle Paul not only believed that, that he's a servant of people he ministered to, he even preached that. He preached that. Second Corinthians 4, chapter verse 5, he writes, We do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. We don't preach ourselves. How often I find today preachers and teachers preaching themselves, talking about their own achievements, their credentials. Paul says, no, I don't preach myself. We preach Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. So angel says, I'm also like you, a servant. Don't worship me. Worship only God. Let's go on from there. Brother, could read from verse 11, brother, brother Joseph. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, brother, let just stop there. It's very obvious who this is. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. And he talks about the description given here. It's fascinating. And uh, along with this, let's also read, going back to Revelation chapter 1, uh, 12 to 16. We read that also, brother. Revelation chapter 1, 12 to 16, the identity of Christ. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, searching down to his, sorry, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. That's the Lord Jesus Christ in a different form altogether. Actually, after he rose from the dead, according to Mark 16, 12, it says he appeared in a different form to people, different form. So here we find a totally different form. He's not in a manger. He's not even on the cross. He's in glory. And now he's coming on a white horse, as John sees, to judge the world. And the, uh, the double edged sword from the mouth is based on the word of God. And verse 13 says, uh, uh, yeah, verse 13, he dressed a rope dipped with blood, and his name is the Word of God. Word of God. And the word in Greek is Word of God is Logos Theo. L-O-G-O-S, Logos. Logos means word. And Theo is God, T-H-E-O-U. So before he entered the world, Christ was the Messiah. Messiah in Hebrew, Christ in Greek basically means the anointed one. He was the son of God, sent from God to the world or to be sent to the world, long time back to his plan. And he was the word of God, always the word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And verse 14 says, and the word became flesh. So here very clearly says, Christ is the word of God, Logos Theo, and or the more came a shop, Sword with which to strike down the nations. The word of God strikes down the nations. And he's quoting a verse from the Old Testament. He ruled them with an iron scepter. That's a reference from Psalm 2, verse 9, where it talks about uh, the uh, verse 7 says, God says to him, the Father says to him, You are my son, today I become your father. 
Ask of me, I make nation your inheritance. So here is a fulfillment, fulfillment of the fulfillment of that. He'll rule the world with an iron scepter along with his children, his people, washed by the blood of Christ. And here it says, on the rope and on his thigh, he has his name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. From verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in mid -air. Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men of war, of horses and riders, and the flesh of all the people. Free and slay, small and great. So now the time has come for judgment on all the authorities, kings, everybody in this world. Because now the king of kings, Lord of Lords, is coming to judge with an iron scepter with the, with the word of God. Verse 19. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and the army. Now the beast we all know from 17th chapter of uh, Revelation. We, re we read about the beast. And uh, the, the, the woman on the beast was actually uh, the great city, uh, 17th chapter was 18. And uh, uh, the city that governs the whole world, we don't know what that is. When the time of judgment comes, you will know at that time. Uh, a world power, a city, the world power that controls the whole world, a city that controls the whole world, that is the beast. Uh, and then the uh, also refers to city on seven hills, Revelation 17, 11. For John, his time, it was Rome, city on seven hills. This beast also refers to seven kings. And uh, they are all uh, leaders, rulers of this world. They are all gathered together, trying to attack, can you imagine, the creator of the heaven and earth, the word of God. They gathered together. And it says, verse 20, But the beast was captured, and with him, the false prophet who had performed miraculous signs on his behalf. Earlier we looked at this uh, beast and the false prophet. False prophet is actually pseudo-prophetess. The Greek word is pseudo-prophetess, one word. Prophetess means prophet, pseudo means, you know, fake. We normally say, you know, intellectual, pseudo-intellectual, pseudo, P-S-E-U-D-O. -E false prophet, who was actually authorized by the, by the beast to go and prophesy. Both together are going to be judged now. Not yet Satan. It's not yet Satan. Satan will be that later on, like a burning sulfur. We'll come to it a little later. Here it talks about the beast and the false prophet who performed miracle signs on, on his behalf. With these signs, he defeated, he, did, he deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them, not yet Satan, two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That's Gehenna. Verse 21, the rest of them were not were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider. Who are the rest of them? All those gathered together to make war against the Lamb, against the Word of God, against Christ. These two are put into the lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds got themselves on their flesh. They were judged by the sword that comes out of the mouth of the Son of God. Now he's the judge. Today, he's the savior of the world. On the judgment day, he's going to be the judge. So please read this two, a few verses. I'm going to give you now before we come back on, on Wednesday. Acts 17, 31. Acts 10, 43, uh, 42. Acts 10, 42. And John 5, 22. These verses talk about Jesus being the judge. As he could judgment. Let me repeat. Acts 17, 31. Acts 10, 42, and John 15, 22. Uh, John 5, 22, not 15. John 5, 22. He talks about Jesus being the judge. So here we find him coming as a judge to take revenge, to avenge, and to give justice to Christians who have been persecuted uh, by the evil one. God bless you all. We'll meet again on Wednesday. And we have Q&A time now after uh, someone. <laughs>